Hey there space enthusiasts! Get ready to blast off into the cosmos with us! Welcome to Spaceverse where the universe is our playground and curiosity knows no bounds. Join us on an interstellar adventure as we dive into the depths of space uncovering its mysteries and marvels. From the secrets of black holes to the landscapes of alien worlds, we're here to ignite your imagination and expand your cosmic horizons. With mind-blowing visuals, expert insights, and the thrill of exploration, Space First is your ticket to the ultimate cosmic journey. So strap and hit that subscribe button, and let's embark on an epic voyage together into the vast unknown of Space First. An absence of a moon base is optimum. Elon Musk is expected to formulate a response along these lines when he is questioned about the most effective method for establishing the first permanent settlement on the moon. It may appear to be nothing more than the typical ramblings of business experts, yet this particular musis is essential for the following reasons. We will now move forward with the actual landing of humans on the moon. The same minimalist design and cutting-edge engineering that have made SpaceX and Tesla famous are required for this big effort with the same requirements. A method that is truly foundational. According to SpaceX, this is the method that will be used to create the first moon outpost. It should come as no surprise that SpaceX does not need to build a moon base. The company is already in the process of building a large starship that is capable of landing on the moon and providing extended periods of continuous support to an astronaut crew. In the beginning, the vehicle was designed with the intention of functioning as a mobile residence, which would be its very own lunar base. A lunar trailer park is what we intend to create by transforming these transportable rockets into permanent residences. This will allow us to achieve our goal. Now let's explore our starship which is a lunar lander and make an effort to comprehend how it operates on the inside. When viewed from the outside our spacecraft appears to be very different from what we are familiar with at this point. The lunar spaceship is almost always depicted with white paint rather than in its raw stainless steel form. This is the primary choice. According to what I can discern, this is essentially a decision that pertains to marketing. There are no wings or heat shield tiles on these lunar ships because they are not intended to return to Earth. Furthermore, there are no heat shield tiles. In light of the fact that they will continually be in some orbit around the moon, we believe that it would be more beneficial to put them to good use rather than allowing them to become gigantic space rubbish. Even though the starship will have a towering profile, only the upper one-third of its length will be filled by crew and cargo. This is a peculiar fact. At this point, the Artemis mission consists of nothing more than fuel tanks. Before the starship embarks on its journey to the surface of the moon, these will be restocked in the same orbit around the Earth. When the rocket enters a translunar injection, it begins to decelerate in order to enter the orbit of the moon, and then continues to slow down in order to drop towards the surface of the moon, the fuel tanks should be virtually empty at this point. Additionally, the final landing move of the Starship will be controlled by a new set of fristers that will be affixed to the vehicle's flanks above the primary fuel tanks. One possibility is that these thrusters are fresh new hypogolic Draco thrusters, but another possibility is that they are the same ones that SpaceX's Dragon spaceship uses. Regardless of the circumstances, the high position of the landing engines on the vehicle serves a purpose that is beneficial. Do you remember how the Odyssey lander tipped over when it was attempting to accomplish its mission of landing on the moon? Due to the fact that the force of inertia is constant, the tall and narrow Odyssey is just as likely to tilt as the starship is. This is despite the fact that the gravity of the moon is somewhat weaker than that of the Earth. A quarter of the amount of energy required to flip something over is required when compared to the amount of energy required on Earth. This is going to come in helpful in the future when we are going to purposefully make objects fall over. However, if you want your spacecraft to land safely on the moon and you don't want it to collapse over, you should position the control thrusters as close to the center of gravity of the motor vehicle as you possibly can. With regard to the interior of the spacecraft, our present designs dictate that it will consist of three stories with a total volume of approximately 1,000 cubic meters. Due to the fact that our cargo hold is located just above the landing thrusters, it will invariably be located on the minimum level. You will find the elevator on the ground level as well as the main entrance there. Because it is impossible to leap 50 feet to the ground even on the moon, the crew will make use of an elevator in order to go to and from the surface of the moon instead. During their multi-day sojourn on the moon, the lower level will be assigned for the storage of all of this equipment and experiments, as well as the EVA suit's necessary supplies, such as food, oxygen, and water, and a diverse assortment of equipment. The rows of windows that are above the cargo hold serve as a visual cue that the primary crew compartment is located. 
as a hub for relaxation, daily exercise, communication with Earth, and spaceship command operations, this section will serve as a focal point for the crew. There is also the possibility that we may install the space toilet, sleeping quarters for the crew, and any other sanitation facilities that are required. Up in the pointy area of the ship, the airlock and docking port that will be used for zero gravity crew transfers from the Orion capsule or gateway station into the starship and back again will be situated at the very top of the ship. In light of this, this component will not be employed in any way during the lunar trip. Consequently, that happens to be the one and only configuration in which the lunar spacecraft has the potential to touch down. Even while it is sufficient for a few of lunar days worth of living expenditures, it is not even close to being perfect for a permanent human settlement on a moon. Unless, of course, you start by turning things entirely upside down. To get things started, let's talk about the most significant feature. It is possible for our transportation rocket to transform into a moon base if we flip it horizontally. This can be attributed to a few different factors, however once we have completed the work, we will address those factors. Although it will be simpler to flip a spacecraft over on the moon, the act of doing so will still be difficult, right? Due to the fact that the gravitational attraction of the Earth is only about one-sixth of that of the Sun, it is predicted that the ship will be far more susceptible to being influenced in a sideways direction. The conclusion that can be drawn from this is that in order to get maximum leverage, all that is required is to pull from the very tip of the nose cone in order to bring the ship over. It is possible that we could drag over one or two moon rovers that have been linked up with cables, but this will depend on the amount of traction that we are able to generate in the lunar dust. That could end up being a limitation in the end. In situations where you require lateral force, you have the option of employing an electric winch that you anchor to the ground, a large boulder, or even the base of the spacecraft. In addition, I have been pondering whether or not a counterweight system is actually required to prevent the spaceship from falling to the ground in a free fall or whether or not it is possible for it to function well without having one. What I don't get is how a low gravity landing on some sand covered area could possibly inflict significant damage to the spacecraft, which is designed to make a belly first impact with the atmosphere of the Earth at a speed of more than 26,000 km per hour. However, it's possible that I'm wrong. After it has been flipped over, we might start the modifications regardless of the situation. We will be implementing a horizontal layout as a consequence of this. While this would make it possible for us to optimize the internal space of the Starship, it would also necessitate the massive removal of the existing structure and the installation of a new floor plan that features a longitudinal orientation. It is the primary concern that I have with regard to this proposition. By doing something on the moon while wearing a spacesuit sounds like a wonderful idea in theory, however if we attempted to do it we would have to rebuild the house using a fraction of the resources and there would be a far larger possibility that we would die or that something catastrophic would occur. For the purpose of addressing this matter, it appears that we are going to have to put our faith in robots and the Tesla bot is only the most recent illustration of this. Furthermore, if we are able to properly outfit the spacecraft that is 50 meters long and 9 meters broad with all that is required for survival and exploration 400,000 kilometers away from our home, then we will have an awesome moon base. In general, we would like to make the interior design as encluttered and fully functional as is humanly possible with a focus on ease of use and comfort for the occupants. With that in mind, I believe that an open concept Starship moon base would be the most suitable choice. Approximately one-third of the rocket's circumference is formed by the construction of a single level floor that runs the whole length of the rocket. This plan not only offers a lovely ceiling to alleviate the claustrophobia that our future moon occupants may experience, but it also offers a substantial amount of storage and equipment space beneath the floor levels. After that we may split the length of the ship among the several services that passengers will subsequently require. A shared amusement room, a kitchen and supper hall, a fitness facility, a sanitation station, and a bunk room for sleeping quarters are all included in the amenities. Additionally, there is a study and scientific lab. Although it is not particularly stylish, it is sufficiently cozy. Following the completion of the construction of our lunar base, the next stage is to make certain that it is shielded from the elements. It is not necessary for us to be concerned about the weather, such as wind or rain but there will be a significant amount of cosmic radiation and meteorites. As a result of the absence of an atmosphere to slow them down, the about 100 meteors that are the size of ping pong balls that impact the moon every day travel at a speed of 72 kilometers per second. Three kilograms of dynamite is equivalent to the amount of kinetic energy that they possess. 
Because the moon does not have a magnetic field to protect it, the surface of the moon is subjected to a barrage of cosmic radiation from the solar wind. It is quite unlikely that an individual would pass away immediately as a result of this degree of radiation exposure. Nonetheless, it would eventually induce cancer by altering their DNA. In order to protect the starship from these two threats, our best option is to cover it with a substantial coating of regolith, which is the soil that found on the moon. The majority of it is necessary. In order to properly protect the surface from cosmic radiation and mild impacts from meteorites, the regolith layer must have a thickness of at least 5 meters. There is no one who has ever claimed that this journey would be risk-free, particularly when considering the possibility of significant meteorite strikes. What makes the Starship so appealing is that SpaceX intends to produce a large number of them. In fact, the company launches as many as one rocket every day. Additionally, the launch costs will be minimal. It follows that in principle there is no requirement that every Starship dock with a moon in order to use it. While the initial lunar starships will only be sent on Artemis missions, subsequent ships may simply be transporting supplies or even robotics. We could dock a starship tanker carrying only water or hydrogen as fuel. I mean the possibilities are practically unlimited. In order to transfer an infrastructure item to the moon it must fit within the upper deck of a starship. That when you stop to consider it is ridiculous. You have to keep in mind that Elon Musk and SpaceX built this starship with the intention of constricting a city on Mars with a population of 1 million, so it's not completely bizarre. This suggests that in theory inhabiting the moon alone should be quite simple. Nonetheless, it's a great chance to get these systems worked out before we launch the entire thing to Mars. A heartfelt thank you for being here with us today as we come to the end of our journey at Spaceverse. Your support is what drives our investigation of the cosmos. Remember to hit the notification bell and subscribe to our channel so that you can continue to explore with us. See you until the next time we cross packs in the cosmos.